I want to introduce you to Lila Rose. Uh, Lila is coming to us live from California. I um, first met Lila at um, the Family Research Council Values Voter Summer in about 2007 or 8. I think she was probably about 19 at the time. She spoke there and I met her in the corridor. She won't remember me, but I said, I'm from New Zealand and I'm going to get you down here one day. She would have forgotten about it. Uh, but she finally agreed that she uh, would speak to us. She has a one and a three-year-old because she's so pro-life uh, and almost persuaded her to come down. I dropped in to see her when I was coming back from a Charleston conference that I was at with Walt Heyer and Casey um, a couple of months ago and dropped in to see Lila and see the work she was doing. She was inter interviewing Francis Chan at the time, who some of you might have heard of. Uh, but let me just briefly tell you, at the age of 15, Lila founded and now serves as president of Live Action. Her investigative reporting on the abortion industry has been featured in major news outlets. She was named among National Journal's 25 most influential Washington women under 35 and Christianity Today's 33 under 33. Uh, she is the author of Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World, superb book, and as, as I said, she lives with her husband in California with her uh, two very young children that were just a little bit too young for us to get them on a plane to come in person. But we think on video is just as good as she online team as uh, she is, and she can see me. I can see you. <laughs> hey, Lila, welcome to New Zealand, albeit uh, virtually. We're stoked to have you. Uh, we have basically put aside this hour for you to share. Uh, we're just stoked to have you. Really appreciate your time because we know how busy you are. We know you've just been in Washington, D.C. at the first year anniversary of uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade. So, uh, Lila, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It is truly an honor to join you today and to get to address you at the Supporters of Family First. 800 people strong in New Zealand. I mean, you're you're taking over the country with these numbers. It's incredible. And these are, you are all uh, leaders, activists, supporters who understand the moment that New Zealand is in, that the world is in, in the fight for life. So it's a real honor to get to present to you. And I'm really looking forward to making it to New Zealand in person, Bob. I will be coming in person in the future. Then we don't know when yet, but I, I really look forward to it because New Zealand is truly one of the most beautiful countries in the entire world. And uh, many Americans dream of getting to come and visit your beautiful country. So it's really an honor too, because our fight, the fight for life in the United States, the fight for, for life in New Zealand, it is the same fight. It is the same fight. It is the recognition of the value of every single human life. And it is the realization of the great crisis that we are facing. And the crisis globally that we are facing of abortion, the deaths, the deaths of our most precious children globally in the United States and New Zealand, these are all children. These are all equal in the eyes of God, should be treated equally by the law, and yet they are not. And so I so appreciate, first of all, the fact that as you fight for family in New Zealand, you see with moral clarity the time that we are in. And you see that the child, if we do not defend the child and that child's first human right, which is life, we can't have a family. We can't have a country. We can't have a civilization. And so thank you for prioritizing life, Bob. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to each and every one of you here. There's many issues that you care about. I know that Family First cares about many different causes, but you see that the fight for life, the fight for the first human right, which is life for the most vulnerable members of society, our children, is truly, I believe, the defining cause of the day. I want to start today by sharing some of my story, why and how I came to see this as the cause of the day, how I started my work. I wanna share then some strategies in the fight for life that I have found to be most effective to save lives and to change hearts and minds. And then I want to share some more personal thoughts for all of us about the spiritual aspect of this and encouragement I hope for each of you 
to make the difference that you are called to make. Because I believe each person here is called to make a tremendous difference. And it's really a question of how then do I take action? What does that action look like? So to start out, as Bob mentioned, I started my organization Live Action as a teenager. I am no longer a teenager. That was almost 20 years ago. But I started Live Action out of a broken heart after learning facts about abortion. And I was a kid. I was growing up in San Jose, California. So I said New Zealand is very beautiful. We all want to visit New Zealand. The other competitor to New Zealand, I believe, is California. I'm very blessed to live here and be born and raised. We have our darkness here, though. It is a abortion central in the United States, especially now in the fall, after the fall of Roe v. Wade. But growing up as a kid in San Jose, California, uh, this is the heart of Silicon Valley, where ultimately Facebook and Google and Microsoft would rise up out of this little um, beautiful valley in Northern California. But I was one of eight kids. So I had already a pro-life upbringing. Uh, anyone who's listening involved in the homeschool movement or you're involved in uh, having kids yourself or have a lot of children, I was blessed to be homeschooled and raised by a parent who really loved life. And that was evident by how they had eight of us. And I'm the third oldest, the oldest girl. And one of my passions growing up, besides helping out with my mom and the kids, I loved all the babies in the house, but it was to read. And it was through my love of reading that I would become impassioned about the fight for life. And it was a book that I found one afternoon in my parents' home reading a book called A Handbook on Abortion. My parents um, had, you know, abortion wasn't really talked about growing up. They were certainly pro-life, but we weren't, we weren't an activist family. And this book that I found one afternoon was called A Handbook on Abortion, and it was by Dr. and Mrs. Wilkie, who are these two pioneers of the pro-life movement in the United States. I didn't know that at the time. But uh, Jack the, and his wife, um, Mr. and Mrs. Wilkie, in the founding of their organization, would found one of the first national activist groups in the United States in the wake of the Roe v. Wade decision. So 1973, as many of you may know, the, the, the terrible history in the United States of abortion, 1973 was when Roe v. Wade was passed down by the Supreme Court in the US. Seven judges voted abortion to be a constitutional right, which is a sham, it's a lie. And since then, over 60 million children have been killed in the United States. I didn't know any of this yet. I was a kid, I'm reading this book, and I'm learning about abortion for the first time in, in, in any kind of um, serious way. And it falls, when I'm reading the book, there's an insert. And there's an insert of photographs in this book. And I look, I open it up and I'm looking. And what I see for the first time was development of a child. I see these beautiful images of fetal development, embryonic development. You can see the humanity of the baby. But then I turn the page and there is an image of a child in about the first trimester. And you can see in the first trimester, the whole body of the child's formed by the end of that first trimester. You see arms, legs, a tiny newly formed little face. And I'm looking at the picture of a child with those arms, those legs, that little face. 10 weeks old, first trimester, who had been suctioned apart by the powerful vacuum of a first trimester suction aspiration abortion procedure. And this body had been torn apart of this child. And I remember looking at this image and just being heartbroken by it, wondering how could this be? How could anyone do this to this child? Why did this happen? How did this happen? I studied, I started to obviously finish that book. At the time in the United States, this was the most common abortion procedure. Abortion, it was and is today in many states legal through all nine months of pregnancy. And today there are 2,500 abortions in the United States every single day. And as I learned this, I became convicted because what I saw was undeniably a human being, a human life that had been snuffed out. And I felt convicted that I had to do something about this, that this was a human rights abuse happening in my own community that I had to speak out against. And I learned that miles from my own home in San Jose growing up, 10 miles away, there was a Planned Parenthood abortion clinic. Now, many of you know about Planned Parenthood. They're a global uh, or corporation as long as, as well as being the leading abortion provider in the United States. And they, were 10 miles from my childhood home, I found out, killing babies up to six months pre-born, 24 weeks of pregnancy. And I just thought, 
why isn't anyone doing anything about this? What can I do about this? Why did I never hear about this in my church growing up? Growing up in a beautiful evangelical church, I had never heard my pastor or my youth pastors talk strongly or any any clear way about abortion and how wrong it was and what our response should be as a church. And so out of my heartbreak over the reality of abortion, I started live action. And at the time, live action was a student group in my parents' living room. And our job was we're going to educate people because I believed and I believe it to this day. And I hope that this is one of the encouragements that you can leave today with that anybody can change their mind on abortion, that people change their mind, have a change of heart in abortion every single day. And this is happening, I see with the work of live action today, when they are given an opportunity to know the truth, and especially when the truth is given to them in a winsome way, when they learn the humanity of the baby, when they learn the brutality of abortion and the evils of it, when they learn the pro-life arguments and logic and they start to connect those dots, people do change their minds on abortion. And so my focus initially with live action was change hearts and minds and start with other young people as I was a 15 year old, start with other 15 year olds in my San Jose, California geographic location. And it wasn't until I got to my university that live action took on a more national focus. And I'm gonna speak to that in a moment, but I first wanna share something that helped cement the human rights fight for life as the most important right, rights fight of the day. And I wanna share this with you because again, as I said earlier, I know a lot of you are involved in a lot of different causes and they're worthy causes. There's a lot of causes around defending the family that matter tremendously. But the fight for life is the foundational fight. And as a kid, I was really involved in pro-life, getting learning more, and I came across the writings of Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa, many of you know her, she is this beautiful, she was this beautiful, humble nun from Calcutta, India, who did her work in Calcutta, India. She wasn't from there, but she ended up spending her life's work in Calcutta. She founded the Missionaries of Charity. She served the, the dying and the suffering in the poorest parts of India. And she had so many uh, people that joined her Missionaries of Charity that were inspired by her love. And she ended up winning a Nobel Peace Prize. So she got a Nobel Peace Prize for her work. You know, the whole world admired her and loved her, you know, loved and admired her. Uh, although, you know, Al Gore got the Nobel Peace Prize and other people. So I don't know how, you know, I don't know what that means anymore. I don't know if you know Al Gore. He's kind of the 1990s uh, American politician behind the climate change, uh, his opinions on climate change. But the point is, many people found her to be an expert on peace and on on works of charity because she was this universally acclaimed figure. And so this little nun came to the United States after winning her Nobel Peace Prize. She came to the United States and she gave a speech before the, the president and his wife and all of these very powerful political figures in the U.S. at the National Prayer Breakfast. So this is an annual event that the United States hosts. I don't know, uh, Bob, you've probably gone. Bob goes everywhere. Um, but it was this event and they have it every year. And even the pro-abortion politicians come. I mean, it's kind of this universal event around just faith, big picture faith, not just Christianity, but you know, Islam or really any faith that has any kind of prayer or meditation. All that to say, Mother Teresa shows up. She is the keynote speaker. And she goes, and this is in 1994, and she's speaking before at the time, Bill Clinton, who was one of our most infamous presidents. For those that don't know, he was involved in scandal after scandal, but he was also the president that refused to ban partial birth abortion. So the U.S. Congress sent President Clinton three different times federal legislation, so our national legislation, that would ban killing the baby when the baby's already coming out of the mother's birth canal. So the baby's actually half born. The feet have been taken out of the mother, the torso, and the abortionist stabs that baby's neck with the scissors and sucks out that living, moving baby's brains. And this is a full-term baby. And this was the Congress was trying to ban this because it's the most torturous, heinous procedure you can even imagine. It's infanticide. The president who was so pro-abortion, he refused to ban it. That's how extreme American politics have become and, and have been. And so Mother Teresa shows up 
Bill Clinton is there, Hillary Clinton is there, all of these pro-abortion politicians. She gets up on stage and she says to them, as this defender of peace, you know, she's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She says, the greatest destroyer of peace in the world today is abortion. And then she says, in a nation where a mother can kill her own child, what is left but for you and for me to kill one another? There was total silence in that room. And those words resonated. They rever rever reverberated because she's right. If we allow the killing of the child in the most vulnerable, most safe place, the womb where they're supposed to be the bond, this most sacred bond of connection, we've destroyed peace in the place where peace should be the most secured. And so when I read that, her speech, I was convicted. I said, okay, this is, this is not just a cause. This is the cause. Because if we cannot protect our children, we have nothing. And if we cannot protect the first human right, which is life, the right to life is first. You can't enjoy any other right. The right to freedom of assembly, the right to freedom of speech, the right to uh, uh, property. You can't enjoy any other right if you don't have your right to not be killed, protected. And yet we're depriving that of the weakest members of society, both in the United States, in New Zealand, and in countries across the globe. So I get to UCLA, I'm fired up. That's when live action takes on its national, fo natural, national focus because I started doing investigative reporting of abortion clinics. And this was born out of realizing, and you see this in New Zealand, the bias of the media. The media, most media today is pro-abortion. They say they're pro-choice or for women's rights, but the way they report on the pro-life side is very biased. They do not expose abortionists. When was the last time in the United States, the New York Times, one of our most famous uh, papers, did an investigation into abortion clinics. They don't touch them. They'll investigate conservatives or they'll investigate uh, presidents they don't like, or they'll investigate uh, you know, the Catholic church, they'll investigate any kind of other thing, but they will never investigate abortion clinics. Why? Because abortion is this sort of sacred, almost ritual for the pro-abortion side. You can't touch it. They say it's a woman's right, it can't be touched. But as a college student, I knew, no, this is not a woman's right. I don't have a right to kill my child. I believe in women and empowerment and our dignity as women and that we should be treated equally under the law to men. Of course, in that sense, I'm an original feminist, but there's no right that I have as a parent to kill the child within. And that doesn't empower me as a woman. In fact, if anything, abortion has denigrated women and abortion has empowered instead abortionists that prey on vulnerable women and prey on children. And so I wanted to expose this. I wanted to become the media. And this is when Live Action started to, uh, with a small group, you know, we weren't really developed yet, but I started to go undercover into abortion clinics in Los Angeles, where I was a student. And I began to expose the sexual abuse cover-up that was happening in abortion clinics. So Planned Parenthood, claims to be all about protecting women and for women and all these things, but they lie to women. They kill children. Planned Parenthood is the biggest abortion chain in the United States. They kill a thousand children in the United States alone every single day. And they get tremendous tax funding. They get hundreds of millions of dollars in tax funding every single year from the federal government. But in our clinics and the daily clinics, they're not providing choices for women. They're not providing prenatal care. They're not providing adoption services. They're not providing parenting services. They're not providing support for parents to learn how to take care of their kids or practical resources, you know, diapers and, um, you know, equipment or financial resources to empower parents. They don't do any of that. Their name is Planned Parenthood, but what they really are is planned death for children and the destruction of children, the destruction of parenthood. And so I wanted to expose this. I showed in 17 different abortion clinics over a period of about two or three years, I showed Planned Parenthood covering up the sexual abuse of young girls because the reality is a lot of girls who get abortions and women are feeling pressure or coercion or they're coming from situations that are 
pressuring or abusive. And for young girls who are sexually abused and become pregnant, their abuser takes them to an abortion clinic or to a hospital to do an abortion. He doesn't want intervention. He doesn't want that baby to be born because that shows that this girl was raped or the victim of incest or whatever it might be. So he wants an abortion. We documented many cases where young girls were the victims of incest, being raped by their fathers or being raped by another man that was involved in their family unit or a school coach, and they get pregnant. They would be taken to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood would not intervene, would not ask questions, would do a secret abortion and send the girl back to her abuser. And this is despite the fact that there is a law, there are actually 50 laws in all 50 states in the United States to prohibit the cover-up of sexual abuse and to mandate that health providers like Planned Parenthood, if you're a health provider, you must report to authorities child sexual abuse. Any kind of abuse that you even suspect needs to be immediately reported. But Planned Parenthood does not do that. They cover up the abuse. Why? Because they're selling abortions. They're just getting her, get her in, get her out, get her in, get her out get the abortions done. They have a very big abortion focused model. So when I documented this and I started to report on this, you know, these Planned Parenthood workers telling me to lie about my age, I would be posing as a 15 year old girl saying that I had a much older boyfriend and the Planned Parenthood worker would tell me, um, I didn't hear that. You know, I would say I'm, I'm 13. I have a 31 year old boyfriend. This is an example. I did this in the state of Indiana at, at two clinics in Indiana, in Bloomington and in Indianapolis. I said, I'm 13. I have a 31 year old boyfriend. So this is a clear, clear case of statutory rape of sexual abuse and Planned Parenthood at the two facilities I visited in that one state, the nurse and the manager or the nurse and the assistant, she, they both told me they, they did not want to know the age. They told me that, they, I told them the age is 31, so they were trying to not hear, say nothing, do nothing. Then they would tell me how they could, my, my abuser, this 31-year-old man could take me across state lines to get a secret abortion. How I could collaborate or as a 13-year-old get a secret abortion without anything being reported. So they willfully worked to try to break the law to get me a secret abortion. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm not going to tell you all the gory stories. A lot of these videos are on the Live Action YouTube channel and on our website. But the point here is Planned Parenthood's focus is not protecting women. It's not the empowerment of women. It's killing children. It's harming children. And it's in the process, in the process, it's exploiting women and girls. And that's the reality of the abortion industry and lobby both in the United States and I believe in any country where abortion exists, because abortion is inherently anti-child and anti-woman. And so when I started to document all of this, the videos went viral, live action started to have a national focus. I discovered firsthand the power of media and the power of speaking the truth and how this can change hearts and minds. And I learned some of my first lessons in dealing with hostile media, dealing with people that, you know, rape threats and death threats and Planned Parenthood threatening to sue me. I, I remember the first time that happened, I was threatened to be sued was by Planned Parenthood, which is this, you know, multi-billion dollar company. And they threatened to sue me as a college student. I was 19 years old. And I remember just, you know, getting this message from them in my dorm room, an email from them telling me that they were going to sue me for criminal, uh, for civil penalties and pursue criminal penalties against me for doing undercover journalism. And I remember praying, sitting on my, on my knees and just asking God to, to use me. I said, God, I'm in over my head. I, I didn't expect this one to happen. At the time, I didn't have a big organization. I didn't have legals and you know legal support lawyers. I was kind of roughing it. And I just said, God, your will be done. Use me, use, use this situation. And God would use that first thread of a lawsuit when I was just a college freshman. He'd use that first thread of a lawsuit to help draw more media attention to my reporting and to bring alliances, to bring people, allies to my side. I started getting help from Alliance Defending Freedom, a great international group. I started getting support from other activists who wanted to join Life Action. And our videos started to go more viral and reach more people. 
So that was an early lesson about how God can turn any roadblock, obstacle, challenge into an opportunity to reach more people, to serve the truth. So now today, live action is reaching 15 to 20 million people every single week with pro-life information, truth about the child in the womb and the baby's beauty, truth about the evil of abortion. We have live action news. We have a political program that's working to pass pro-life laws across the United States. We have an investigative reporting team that's still doing investigative reporting. We do all kinds of videos and social media. And all of this is focused on that original mission, which is to change hearts and minds. I believe, and I know that you see this in New Zealand, that our politics are downstream from our culture. That if our culture is in support of abortion, our politics will be. If our culture is apathetic on abortion and not involved or activated or engaged, our politics will be the same and will permit abortion. It'll just go the way that it has gone. And so we have to invigorate people, educate people, get them prepared to join this fight so that we can get the political gains that we want to get. And so next what I wanna do with the time I have is talk, speak to strategies, strategies for how to win the fight for life, especially when it comes to hearts and minds. And I'm first going to share with you two core strategies that live action uses. And then I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about some of the ways that we deal with the really hard cases meaning the accusations from the pro-abortion side, you don't care about women, you know, what about rape, what about incest, some of these very challenging cases that people use in order to justify abortion. But first I wanna share with you our first strategy. Our first strategy education in our educational campaigns is to show the humanity of the baby. You see the pro-abortion side has succeeded in hiding the humanity of the baby. They say it's just a bunch of cells, it's just a blood clot, it's not a person yet, it's not a life. So they try to desensitize people to the child's beauty and they try to make people think it's not a big deal to have an abortion, it's not really a baby yet. And so our best response is to show that this is a baby with any opportunity that we have. And so Live Action has developed a video and a series of content with medical experts and with world-class animators that actually shows the beauty, the humanity of the baby, of the human person from the very beginning, from the moment of fertilization. Because we know science shows us when life begins. It's kind of ironic, the pro-abortion side sometimes accuses the pro-life side of not being you know, science-based, you know, evidence-based, uh, fact-based. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's the pro-life side that is the side of science. We know when human life begins. It doesn't begin magically at birth. It doesn't begin randomly at 20 weeks. The life of each of us in this, each of you in this room, me here, the life, each of our lives begin at the moment of fertilization, when a unique sim single cell embryo comes into existence that needs a, a unique human life with human parents that just needs time and nourishment to grow and will grow rapidly. Within six weeks, the heart will be beating of this child. It's amazing how quickly that embryo grows. So I wanna share with you, introduce to you baby Olivia, which is the most lifelike, uh, medically accurate depiction of human life in the, in the womb. This is Olivia. Though she has yet to greet the outside world, she has already completed an amazing journey. This is the moment that life begins. A new human being has come into existence. At fertilization, her gender, ethnicity, hair color, eye color, and countless traits are already determined. She begins to implant in the uterus about one week after fertilization. Her cells organize into what we call an embryo. At three weeks in one day, just 22 days after fertilization, Olivia's heartbeat can be detected.
the buds of her arms and legs appear by four weeks. She begins to move between five and six weeks with both spontaneous and reflexive movements. At six weeks from fertilization, her brain activity can be recorded and bone formation begins. She can bring her hands together at seven and a half weeks and separate fingers and toes emerge. She can also begin to hiccup. At the beginning of the ninth week, Olivia will have grown from a single cell into nearly one billion cells and she is now called the fetus. She will suck her thumb and swallow, grasp an object, touch her face, sigh and stretch. At 11 weeks, she is playing in the womb, moving her body and exploring her environment. Her taste bud cells have matured by week 12 but are still scattered throughout her mouth. Her mother will first sense Olivia's movement between 14 and 18 weeks, an event called quickening. Beginning at 18 weeks, ultrasounds show speaking movements in her voice box. Around 20 weeks, with a lot of help, babies have survived outside the womb. At 27 weeks, her eyes are responding to light she can recognize her parents' voices and will even recognize lullabies and stories. Olivia has gone on an amazing journey during these last nine months. She will soon signal to her mother that it is time for delivery and greet the outside world. So the beautiful thing about Olivia is she there's nothing about abortion, obviously, in this video. It's just the beauty and the humanity of this little girl. And it's clear, it's clear as day that this is a human life. And it's beautiful. She's beautiful. This is how we all started our lives. This video that you just saw has been viewed now online since Live Action released it over 50 million times. And it's thrilling to see the response from people of this because of this video and content like it. I wanna share with you to encourage you a few of those, uh, those responses. So we do a lot of focus research at Live Action and um, third party research on our content to see how it impacts people. We test our messaging to see how it impacts people. And after viewing Olivia, 12% of people who identify as pro-choice move to pro-life. So Olivia didn't even have anything in it about abortion, but 12% of people who thought who said they were pro-choice became pro-life after watching Olivia. And 37% of viewers that we surveyed who uh, considered themselves pro-choice before considered themselves more pro-life afterwards. So we see just from showing the humanity of the baby, we see amazing results and we see people changing. So one strategy is show the humanity show the beauty of life, show the information, the facts about fetal development. The last thing the pro-abortion side wants you to do and the last thing Planned Parenthood wants you to do is show them what this beautiful life is that they are destroying. They don't wanna humanize the baby, they wanna dehumanize the baby and make all the emotional emphasis on this woman who supposedly wants an abortion when the reality is this is a human life and they have human rights. The next strategy I wanna share with you that I believe is very important for us to win hearts and minds on life is by just as we show the beauty of the baby, we show, and we also are showing the beauty of motherhood, the beauty of fatherhood, we expose the barbaric truth of abortion. We expose the barbaric reality of what abortion actually does. I have seen that when people actually find out, like I did when I was just a kid, when I was, learning for the first time what abortion was and i saw that image of that baby torn apart by abortion i knew this was wrong and many people have no idea what an abortion actually does they think it's just some medical procedure not a big deal women have it it's their right they don't realize that abortion is the dismemberment suctioning to death chemical starvation of a new and developing precious human life so what I want to do next is share with you a second video, which is an example of how we effectively change hearts and minds when it comes to exposing abortion. 
This video, I want to warn you, is difficult to watch. It is not gory, so don't worry, it's not a gory video, but it is medical animations of the first trimester abortion procedure. So you can actually see through a medical animation, so it's kind of like line drawings of what happens during the mechanics of that first trimester, very common, very prevalent abortion procedure. And I think it's important that we all see what it is. In New Zealand, there's 40 to 50 abortions happening every day, most of them in the first trimester. So you're gonna see this is what's happening. This is the about the age, the gestation of the baby that is being killed dozens of times a day. In the United States, it's 2,500 times a day. Most of these babies around this age. There are children who are also killed up six months, seven months pre-born. So the baby's even more developed, but this will give you a showing of what we're actually fighting for. Because keep in mind, people don't realize it. No one's educating people about what abortion actually is. No one wants to actually talk about it. But just like during the time of slavery in the abolitionist movement in the United States, and this was both in the US and in the United uh, Kingdom in, in Great Britain, activists recognized that they had to expose the plight of the slave. They had to show people how horrible the slave ships were, how horrible the treatment of black men and women and children were. And if they didn't show the victim, show the reality of how that person was harmed, people wouldn't care. They would justify it, they would rationalize it. So we have to show the humanity and show how that human is being harmed. And there was a very famous um, photographer in the United States named Lewis Hines. Some of you may have heard of Lewis. He was an activist photographer and he was really influential in eradicating child labor. So part of our dark history in the United States is we permitted child labor, meaning little children, nine, 10 years old, were required to work in factories. This was especially in the 19th century, early 20th century. And these little tiny children would work 10, 11, 12, up to 14 hour days in inhaling smoke, inhaling um, uh, toxins, working with very uh, dangerous machinery. They would lose limbs, they would lose fingers, they would have accidents where they could be killed. And so this photographer, Lewis Hines, in the early, early 20th century, traveled to these factories. He took pictures of children that had been maimed, of children that had been uh, missing arms, missing limbs, been disfigured from this machinery that they were having to manage and, and work to be able to support their families, these little tiny kids. And he would then take those photos and he would travel around the sort of uh, well, well off, you know, higher socioeconomic level, uh, wealthy families, um, you know, dinner parties, cocktail parties, he would fly around or not fly, you'd you know, take trains around. We didn't use as many airplanes then, but he would travel around and he would take these images blown up on poster boards and he'd show them to people. And people would say, don't show these images. They're so horrible to look at. You're ruining my dinner party, you know? And he would say, I'm going to continue to show these images until people realize that they're so horrible that they will do away with the practice altogether, that they will do away with the practice of child labor altogether. And it was Lewis Hines' activism that helped eradicate and ban child labor in the United States and in, enact child labor laws. So all this to say, showing the truth about the injustice, the human rights abuse is necessary to wake people up and to get them activated to fight the evil. So the next video is narrated by a former abortionist. So this is a uh, medical expert that Life Action has worked with who has actually committed abortion procedures, um, thousands of them. And he's gonna narrate one of the most popular abortion procedures in the United States through medical animation. It's a three minute video. Um, if you need to, you can look down if it feels overwhelming, but I highly encourage that everybody watch this and understand what it is that we're fighting. My name is Dr. Beverly McMillan. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist with 45 years of experience, and I've completed around 500 abortions. Today, I'm going to explain a first trimester suction DNC abortion, also called vacuum aspiration abortion. This is typically used up to 14 weeks of pregnancy. 
When the woman goes to the facility for the abortion, she will lie on a table with her feet in stirrups, and she will be administered local anesthesia. The abortionist will place a speculum like this inside the vagina and open it, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix is grasped with a long metal instrument to stabilize it. A series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness, are inserted into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the fetus resides. The abortionist then inserts into the uterus a hollow plastic tube with a hole in it called a cannula and attaches it to suction. If the embryo is small enough, the cannula can be attached to a syringe and manual suction alone will remove the embryo and placenta from the uterus. Otherwise, the cannula will be attached to a suction machine. The suction machine is turned on and the abortionist slowly rotates the cannula inside the uterus. The fetus is rapidly torn to pieces as it is pulled through the cannula and tubing into a large glass bottle, followed by the placenta. Sometimes smaller embryos are pulled through intact. Occasionally, the abortionist must remove the cannula and pull out body parts that have clogged the opening to complete the abortion. Once the abortionist thinks everything has been removed, she will sometimes use a long metal curette to scrape the lining of the uterus to make sure no parts are left behind. An incomplete abortion can cause infection or bleeding. Once the uterus is empty and the bleeding is under control and all the instruments are removed, the abortion is considered complete. But before the patient leaves, the tissue must be examined to make sure the placenta and all the body parts are accounted for. Two arms, two legs, a spine, a skull, the risks of suction abortion include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels. Other risks include hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I said at the beginning, I used to do abortion, in fact, I helped to open the first abortion clinic in the state of Mississippi in 1975. At that time, I thought abortion was what women needed, and I was totally oblivious to the life of the child. But one day, I looked at the remains of a 12-week-old baby boy that I had just aborted, and I thought to myself, what is the difference between this little boy and my own four-year-old son? I came to recognize that abortion doesn't just end a pregnancy. It kills an innocent human being. Now, I am a pro-life advocate. I am proof that anyone can change, no matter who they are or what they have done. I invite you to join me and make a decision to protect the preborn. The abortion procedure videos are heartbreaking to watch, but these, the video you just saw is part of a series of videos which have been seen together over a hundred million times online. And when we survey and test these videos, um, we find people move on the issue of abortion they become more pro-life one of the focus groups that we did or the surveys i should say that we did of pro-choice women after viewing one of these videos thought that abortion 19 percent of pro-choice women thought that abortion should never be legal after viewing the video and then another 21 percent of people increased so there was a 21 percent increase of people who believed overall that abortion should never be allowed so it is amazing to see that if we are fearless in showing the humanity of the baby and winsome, you know, we're doing this in a winsome way, and then we're fearless in showing the evil of abortion, that minds do change. Now, this isn't enough to change minds, so I want to speak to one more thing before I wrap here and give you um, some of the some things to encourage you in your fight. But the other thing that's crucial in the fight for life, a crucial strategy, is answering objections. So I'm sure you've had friends or family or even other activists who say, okay, I'm pro-life or maybe they're pro-choice, but the reason they're pro-choice, they say, you know, they're for reproductive rights is because, well, what about rape or incest? Or what about the life or health of the mother? So I do wanna, for a moment, respond to these, these concerns. And I want to also encourage you to be educated on these objections because there are answers, there are great answers to these objections, that if we can provide these answers winsomely to other people, we can help persuade people to be pro-life. So Live Action has a series, and we have a ton of content on our website, liveaction.org, but we have a series of videos called Pro-Life Replies to Pro-Choice Questions. 
So it's done in a very non-confrontational way, a very fact-based way. We tell some stories, we provide some statistics, but we show the reason, the logical argument for why these cases do not mean that abortion should be accepted in any for any of these situations. So the core pro-life argument, I'm gonna give you guys this, you probably have heard this, if you haven't heard this before, I encourage you to write this down because this is the core reason why abortion should never be permitted. And it's a logical syllogism. So it's a basically a, a sound argument for life. And the first part of it is, it is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human. So I think most people agree, I bet every everyone in New Zealand would agree, and certainly in America, well, let's say 90% of people, 95% would say, yes, it's always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent person, an innocent human. The second uh, statement of the logical syllogism is abortion ends the life of an innocent human. And we just proved that. We showed that Olivia is a human. We showed what abortion does, it ends a life. If abortion doesn't end a life, what does it do? It's designed in ending a pregnancy, It is designed to end the life of that child. And the third part of the logical syllogism, the conclusion is, therefore, it is always wrong. Abortion is always wrong. Therefore, abortion is always wrong. Because if it is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human life, and if abortion kills an innocent human life, the logical conclusion is abortion is always wrong. And so some people will say, well, what about rape and incest? And I want to address that. What happens during a, a rape? A rape is absolutely horrific. It's one of the most evil things that anybody could do to another person. It's sheer evil. And survivors of rape and incest deserve our advocacy, our support. They deserve care. They need to be removed from the situation of abuse. Like my investigations had shown, many of these abusers uh, keep their victims in abuse cycles with abortion, actually. But what do we do if a girl or a woman gets pregnant in a situation of rape? Well, a lot of pro-abortion folks would say, well, she should have an abortion. When you look at the two studies that have been done on women who have been survivors of rape and how they have had the opportunity to choose life or abortion, and it's found that 80%, nearly 80% of them chose life themselves because when they had the when they had the opportunity, because they found that abortion, they wanted to reject it. They didn't want to have an abortion after going through that trauma. There's a lot of psychological reasons for that, but then they did a, an additional part of the study and they found that over 80% of women who had had and chosen life, who had ch had the baby, said that they are glad that they did, that they did not regret it. And they found that the large majority of women who had had an abortion regretted the abortion. Why? Why would this be? Why would the majority of rape survivors who have abortions regret it and the majority of rape survivors who choose life not regret it and be happy that they had the baby? It's because abortion is a second act of violence. Abortion is a second trauma because what abortion does is it takes out the penalty for the crime of rape on that third party who's innocent, the child in the womb, killing that child in the womb who has the right to live. They're not guilty of rape. They're not guilty of crimes. They are innocent. They're a third party. What we should do is take out the penalty on the abuser, not the third party. And we also shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that abortion is going to heal a rape survivor. I think there's so much emotion around this. And so many people are so you know, just, just disturbed by the idea of rape because it's horrific. And so they think, well, we're going to you know, solve the rape in some way because it's so horrible that she's pregnant and there's this baby. The problem is an abortion doesn't solve the, the evil of it in any way it only adds evil it adds trauma to that woman it kills an innocent baby and it doesn't unrape her it doesn't take away the trauma that that rape survivor endured so abortion is not the just or the compassionate response to rape i'm going to do one more quickly and then i want you all to go check out for life replies to pro-choice questions on the live action website i'm going to do the mother's health objection you've heard this in new zealand we hear this in the united states all the time well we need abortions because they're medically necessary. We need abortions because the woman will die without it or she'll be harmed without it. The reality is this, and we work with thousands of medical professionals at Live Action. Abortion is actually not medically necessary. And by abortion, I mean the intentional destruction of an innocent life. In extremely rare cases, you might need to do an early delivery or an early C-section, but you do not need to go in there and target that baby's body and kill that baby to heal or serve or help the mother. 
And over a thousand medical professionals agree with this, who signed the Dublin Declaration, which is a universal declaration on why abortion is not health care, and how the doctors and medical professionals should care for both the mother and the child as both are patients, both deserve care. And so I could get, spend a lot more time on this, but the, but the basic principle is this, the direct and intentional destruction of that life is never medically necessary. One easy way to understand this, because many of you are not medical professionals, is to think about it this way. And of course, that's not my training, but in an abortion procedure, the baby's body needs to be removed from the, from the mother. It's like an early forced birth, or sometimes it's a full term birth. It's just the birth of a dead child. The child has already been killed. In pro-life practice, you do not kill the child. If you need to do a delivery, you wait. You, if the woman has a condition, you, you monitor her health, you, care, you watch her health, you watch the baby's health, and you wait to do a delivery of that child alive to give that child a chance at life. That's why this whole idea of we need late-term abortions for the mother's health is absolutely a lie. It is an outright lie from pro-abortion propagandists. In a late-term abortion, you are killing, you're slaughtering that baby and then delivering them dead. In pro-life healthcare, you monitor and care for the mother and the baby, and you work to deliver the baby alive. Killing the baby is never healthcare. With that said, I wanna close out here to talk about the fight and our response personally, because you know we could spend a lot more time talking about tools and strategies. And again, I hope that live action can be a resource and a support to you and the great the great work that you are doing, each of you in your communities and in your country. But at the end of the day, I believe we have a tremendous battle in front of us. Lives are being lost. There's tremendous pro-abortion propaganda. There's tremendous lies being told. And the reality is some people, you can educate them, you can persuade them, and they still are pro-abortion. There's some people who will still choose to be pro-abortion, even after all the education, even after all, all of the persuasion. So what do we do with that reality? And that's why I believe this is not just a political battle or a cultural battle, it is a spiritual battle. And I want to share this as a Christian. I know some of you are people of faith. We all, uh, the pro fight is people of all different faiths and all different backgrounds or no faith but I think it is a spiritual battle. And St. Paul says in Ephesians that we battle not against flesh and blood, but that we battle against powers and principalities, that this is a spiritual war and that sometimes prayer, Jesus himself says this, sometimes prayer can drive out certain demons, can drive out certain evils. And so the first thing I wanna leave you with, I'm gonna share just three quick things to close out here. The first thing is this, pray for an end to abortion. If you're a person of prayer, or maybe if you're not yet, give it a shot, pray for an end to abortion, offer sacrifices for an end to abortion. If you can fast or get on your knees each morning, pray for peace in the womb, pray for peace in the family. We need to pray for these things because at the end of the day, we're dealing with free will and people's hearts. And even if they're educated, even if we ban abortion, there's still the heart that we need to reach and prayer is the most powerful tool that we have. So that's the first thing I would say. Pray for an end to abortion. The second thing is this. Just like I said that prayer as a kid, use me, God. Use me to change some lives. Always be willing and ready to speak the truth. The truth is what will set people free. The truth about the humanity of the baby, the evil of abortion, the pro-life argument, the truth about gender, the truth about sex, the truth about marriage, that is what is needed to speak it winsomely. We speak it imperfectly, but we still share it on social media, in our churches, to our children, to our friends, to our family, to our coworkers. Be unashamed of the truth and be willing to share the truth. It is only by sharing the truth that we will change hearts and minds. There is no other way. And then the last thing is get in the fight. This is gonna look different for each of you. Many of you are already in the fight. That's why you're here. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Get in the fight, get activated. That looks like helping women and families, fathers and mothers, maybe through pregnancy resource centers and serving low-income families. It'll look like getting involved in educational nonprofits to go and share these facts. Activism, uh, doing those bold activism, you know, leafletting or flyering or knocking on doors or going places that are unexpected at rallies to share the truth, political work, demanding better from our politicians. Be activated. Don't sit on the sidelines. Get in the fight. 
I believe that if we all do these things, if we pray, if we're truth tellers unapologetically, and if we get in the fight, our movement will grow, it will increase, and we can, with time and with our sacrifice, we can end abortion. So I want to encourage you to keep your eye on that mission, on that vision of a pro-life New Zealand. It is possible. It is possible to change our country. We have been through in the United States many evil, dark eras in our history, and we've overcome. Europe went through in the 20th century some of the bloodiest wars, some of the worst injustices from the Holocaust to the Soviet Union, and we overcame. We can overcome the global Holocaust of abortion if we are willing to join the fight and help achieve that beautiful vision. So thank you all so much. Keep up the amazing work. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Mm -hmm.